I'm sure you've been through this already. Yes. Um, so, um, no flash photography, permission from the students to video, and um, there are just cell phones. Okay. And uh, and then to stay for the entire presentation for those students, then um, you introduce uh, yourselves to your title, and then uh, yeah, ten minutes for your presentation, and then we'll do these questions afterwards. I'm Joseph Mendes. I'm Laura Orta. And I'm Ana Castellanos. And this is Folks Take Responsibility. Debunking the myth, both take responsibility. There is a myth, one that says Mexican Americans do not value the right to an education. The 1950s and the 1960s saw a time of social change in the United States. The Supreme Court case of Brown versus Board marked the end of segregation in the public school system. Unfortunately, there were other forms of injustice that took place throughout the country, particularly in South Texas. For Mexican Americans of Westside San Antonio, this was a call to equality. When it occurs to human events, it becomes necessary to stand up, demand and take responsibility for the right to high quality education. A decent respect to the people of the earth and the United States of America. And all victims of oppression suffered at the hands of inequality which requires that students declare the reasons that impel them to the separation of an institution that has been destructive of its end. The right and responsibility to preserve and secure a high quality education for all citizens of the United States of America. To bear witness, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Blow out! You may know the term better as walk out. These protests took the form of students walking out of their classrooms in protest of unfair treatment of facilities in school. The first blowout was thought to have occurred in California, but it was actually in 1910 in San Angelo, Texas. This blowout lasted until 1915. At the heart of this blowout was the Latino community's demand to attend superior Anglo schools. Now, we the students at Lanier High School continue this method of protest, but with a twist. Usually, it is led by one of our student council leaders. She organizes it and gets people involved. And when you just happen to date the biggest linebacker, it's not hard to get other people involved. The blowout or walkout strategy was used in the 1960s rather successfully at Lanier High School. These notices of inequality and complaints of injustice would trigger a hearing by the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights in 1968. Walk out! Little girl, she paddled us. Paddled you? Yes, sir. And how did you feel about being punished for speaking Spanish? Well, I didn't like it. I didn't like the idea of being punished because I was speaking Spanish. To me, it is the way to identify myself. I feel that it is my language. And I don't see why I shouldn't speak it in school. Since the time one enters elementary school, they are taught that speaking Spanish is bad. I just didn't feel this way. And I couldn't say anything. I didn't know how the other students felt. Well, I didn't like it either. How would you like it for someone to come up to you and tell you what you speak is a dirty language? You know what your mother speaks is a dirty language? Spanish is all that I ever heard at home. For a teacher to come up to you and tell you, no, no, you know that's a filthy language, nothing but bad words and bad thoughts in that language, or you communicate with dirty words and nasty ideas. <laughs> From the beginning since elementary school, that stigma really stuck with me. The first grievance expressed by the group of five students was the punishment or unjust treatment ethnic Mexican students faced for speaking Spanish in school. These incidents were common among Mexican Americans at the time and served as a key grievance for Chicano students, not only at Lanier, but throughout the whole South Texas region. Educational historian Gilbert Gonzalez suggests that it is incidents like that of Ramirez and Lozano suggest how public school officials identified the Mexican language and culture as contradictory to educational success. 
It also reaffirms why Mexican Americans at the time demanded their right to freedom of speech and expression at school. Interestingly, students at Lanier had longed for this type of social change well before the 1960s. At Lanier, do teachers encourage students in terms of going to college? Well, you know, we have a new principal, and he has provided us with representatives from SAC, but before we had any of this, it began recently. Are people ever brought in to discuss career possibilities? For example, do they ever bring in a prominent businessman, lawyer, or educator to urge you into these professions? No, sir. Before this year, all we had was, well, Criminals were brought in from the penitentiaries to encourage us not to go into the life of crime. That is the only interest that they have shown us they've yet, to not go into any special career, and that is a life of crime. That is the only one so far. These are not role models. Hmm. Do you think the curriculum in the San Antonio school system satisfies the Mexican-American student? No. I don't think so. I am given the impression that the Texas history that is being shown to me is the Texas history of the Anglo here in Texas, not the Texas history of the Mexican American or Mexicano. It is to show that Anglo is superior. They reinforce the sense of Anglo superiority and degrade the image of Mexican Americans and other ethnic minorities. Hmm. I don't know how many times I have been told to remember the animal for all the innocent Anglos killed at the savage hand, and to forget the battle of San Jacinto. They reinforce negative stereotypes and historical myths about Mexican Americans. Mexican American students at Lanier face significant disadvantages, unlike those attending other high schools in different parts of the city. Former Mexican American students contend that other local high schools always had newer facilities, more financial resources, and a predominantly Anglo-American population. The urge for curricular reform served as a key grievance for protesters who demanded the right for college preparatory classes. We don't have handicapped children. We have a handicapped educational system. We are not handicapped because we're bilingual. We're handicapped because we have an educational system that doesn't understand bilingual students. We at Lanier are not ready for college. We don't even have algebra. Algebra and calcula, calculus. If Anglo Americans can, can handle calculus, so can we. We, Mexican, Mexican Americans, Americans, are just as good. But if they offered these things to us now, we couldn't pass them. We're not prepared. President Lyndon Johnson would say that it was time we proclaimed our fifth freedom the freedom to learn, the freedom to the education. Like every freedom, it comes with a promise that everyone has the same access, the same right to this freedom of an education. This is why we protest, this is why we walk out. We have the responsibility to stand up for this right if it is not being fulfilled. For the Latino students at Lanier, the right to an education is not being fulfilled. So we stand up and let our voices be heard until this right is realized. You might ask yourself if these protests or these walkouts make a difference. Just ask the Latinos from San Angelo who walked out in protest of being denied the right to attend a new school. They were granted this access. Just ask the Latino stu students at Westminster School District who had a Supreme Court case ending segregationist practices. Just ask the Lanier folks what every demand they placed on the district without having to walk, walk out. Today, this fight for the right to a quality education continues. State Judge John Deeds would rule that the Texas education system is ineffective and inadequate in regards to funding. The responsibility falls on us to take the lessons from Lanier and apply it to this injustice because education is our right and it is our responsibility to fight for it.